All right, so today we're going to talk about armored spouses. Wait, I'll check my notes. Scale armor, that's what it was. So first, I'm going to talk about some practical implications of scale armor and then give you a brief uh, introduction about what we know about scale armor in history. And then the next video is going to be some tests on scale armor. Not this, because that's too nice. I got a <laughs> very rusty scale armor that I got for that particular purpose. This one here is not a historical reproduction. It's something that one of my subscribers made and sent in. Thank you, by the way. More of a, a modern version inspired by historical uh, scale. And it's actually really nicely made. It covers pretty well. And it's really comfortable. Oh, it? absolutely. I and can also, hardly feel it. The, the scales on this one are pretty thin. Let me uh, check. So we've got 0.8 millimeters. Oddly enough, that's actually historical. There were even thinner ones. There are some finds of scales that are 0.5 millimeters. So that is really astonishingly thin, actually. This is one of the uh, major drawbacks of scale. Anything that comes in from underneath can actually slip through any rising thrust. That applies to this particular type of scale armor, which is the most common. There are other patterns as well which avoid that issue, and I'll talk about those later. A straight thrust from the front is not going to go anywhere, as would be a, a downward thrust. That would be particularly likely to just glance off and be redirected. Depending on how the scale is arranged, a thrust could also go in between through scales. Not on this particular one, but the one that I'm going to test, you'll see that happen there. So this is actually uh, better arranged. It does protect very well against cuts. <laughs> Don't worry, I'll be gentle. Mm -hmm. That's what you always say. So <laughs> it doesn't really take away much of the force, like the blunt impact, if any, particularly on the collarbone. If something struck right here, the collarbone is pretty exposed. So that in and of itself is not gonna do that much. If you have padding underneath, however, some kind of arming garment or a gambeson, something like that, that would help distribute the force of the impact a little more. And also I'm guessing, uh, can't really prove it, but I'm guessing that this is going to distribute the force more than male would, simply because the individual pieces are larger. This is, of course, also a lot more flexible than plate, but not quite as flexible as male. So, you see, it, it does move pretty well, but they, they move more in, in larger clusters, if you will, because the individual scale, of course, is not going to flex, so you have a larger non-flexible area compared to a single ring on male. Together with the curvature of the torso, stuff is more likely to just glance off. You know, not just thrusts, but also cuts. We've seen that in tests where it would actually deflect the blade. So it is pretty good protection. Even a fantasy leather armor with metal studs can be surprisingly protective against many sword cuts. And well-made riveted mail is pretty much impervious to slicing cuts with most swords. So scale armor is going to be even better against cuts. An axe, of course, is a different story because it has a lot more mass in the blade. It concentrates the force on a shorter edge and less of the edge is in contact with the armor. So the rings or scales can't distribute the force as widely and evenly. It's easy to wear. I can just about feel it on the shoulders and that's all it is. Mm -hmm. um, it's... And if you had a belt, you wouldn't even. Just like with mail, because the belt would hold it here and take some of the weight off your shoulders. I'm trying to figure out if it's sitting a little bit on my hips. It might. Probably. You have pretty wide hips. So, Thanks. And it's also more ventilated than plate would be. Um, not, again, not as much as male. This is kind of in between male and harder armor. It does heat up under here. It does heat up, yeah, of course. And particularly if you were to wear padding underneath, this would get pretty bad. And just padded armor by itself, or a gambeson can heat you up a lot. If you have that underneath, that's gonna be pretty bad. Uh, so that's the usual problem, but that's always the case with armor. And it's loud. So you're not gonna go Assassin's Creed in this. 
It's just <laughs> have a completely unrelated and irrelevant but fun observation. If somebody were to uh, fight you barehanded and throw an uppercut, they would skin their knuckles basically on this. Again, it's not like that would have happened, but it's kind of fun to think about. You're pretty damn drunk if you throw an uppercut against us. <laughs> pretty much. Or if you do a headbutt. That's also not going to be fun. Anyway, let's get to the historical part. So first off, how does one even define scale armor and distinguish it from lamellar? The two are often used interchangeably. I've often seen lamellar armor, or at least what I would consider to be lamellar armor, called scale armor. I'm not an expert on armor, but in the book Armor Never Wearies by Timothy Dawson, he gives a pretty good definition. Scale armor overlaps downward and is predominantly mounted on a continuous substrate, usually of textile or leather. Lamellar overlaps upwards, does not have a continuous new substrate and its structure is created using some sort of cordage. And as the author points out here, there are a few exceptions, there are always exceptions, but it seems to apply pretty well in general. The main exception here is the early Roman imperial semi-rigid scale armor. It looks a lot more like lamellar at first glance, but the pieces still overlap downward, so it still somewhat falls under this definition. Either way, you could argue whether this should be called lamellar or scale armor, as so often there is some gray area. The author also defines five distinct types. Type 1 and 2 were the most common. They were used in a lot of different places and time periods. Uh, type 3 is rare. It's apparently almost exclusively found in medieval Russia. Finds of type 4 are from late antiquity, generally Roman. Although one can't exclude the possibility of type 4 in medieval times where most of the evidence is actually depictions and art rather than archaeological finds. And type 5 is Roman, used from the 2nd to 4th centuries. This type wasn't very common, even in the Roman Empire. If you recall what I said earlier about the risk of upward thrust slipping under the scales, type 3 and 5 would eliminate that. They would hold together so a blade couldn't lift up scales and slip under that way. Which makes me wonder why they weren't more common relative to the other types. I'm guessing this may just be a matter of time and effort, because these would be more difficult and time consuming to make, and sometimes for war you just have to crank out the armors, so that could be a factor. As the earliest surviving example, the armor from King Tutankhamun's tomb is often mentioned, which would be over 4,000 years old. To me, this looks more like lamellar. It was apparently made from rawhide and is in astonishing condition considering the age. So I guess whether this is scale or lamellar is debatable. There are many examples of ancient Greek and Eurasian scale armors. The Greek ones are made of bronze scales with a distinctive central ridge, and the Eurasian one on the right is made of leather, one of the few cases where leather was actually preserved. And this looks like a lot of work. It's quite a large number of comparatively small scales. And then as already mentioned before, Roman scale armor or Lurica squamata. These could be made either of bronze or iron. From what I can tell, bronze seems to have been more common, or at least more commonly found. Bronze tends to preserve better in the ground than iron does. And as I said, some of the types look a lot like lamellar, except for the downward overlap. I also found a depiction of Dacian scale armor from Trajan's column. Now, whether that is accurate or not, I don't know for sure. The Romans are known for taking artistic license every now and then. Here's an example of Persian Sassanid horse armor on the left. The picture on the right might be somewhat inaccurate, I don't know about that, but I included it because it looks pretty neat. That's sometimes all the reason you need. From what I've read, scale armor was in general relatively common in the early Middle Ages, then rarer in the 11th and 12th century, and then it virtually disappeared by the mid-14th century. And evidence for medieval scale armor seems to be mostly depictions rather than material finds. From the Battle of Wispy, there are some finds of lamellar armor, and also another type of armor, the coat of plates, which can look like scale at first glance, but is different. Some people have argued that the Bayou tapestry shows not only male, but also scale armor. We know that male hauberks were commonly worn both by Saxon and Norman warriors. About the scale, I doubt it. They just had to depict male with these large rings because of the limitations of the medium. They could only produce so much detail. And there's one piece of potential pictorial evidence for Saxon scale armor, and that's this one. I don't know enough about it to judge its accuracy, but it seems safe to say that if the Saxons or Normans had scale armor, it was rare and possibly not even made by them, and same for the Vikings. They might have gotten it elsewhere, but they probably didn't make it themselves. Either way, there are a few medieval depictions that look more obviously like scale and are distinct from images of male armor. 
And here's a rare oddity, a 16th century Italian steel breastplate with bone scales on top. I don't think that counts as scale armor. There are some outliers in later times, like pieces of scale armor found in New Mexico used by Spanish conquistadors, and Polish hussar armor from between the 17th and 18th century. And finally, I saved the strangest one for last, here's an armor coat from early 19th century India made of gold-decorated pangolin scales. I'm guessing this might also be where the idea originated, people looking at animals with protective scales and then figuring, you know what, our exposed flimsy human skin could use an upgrade, I want that. Anyway, so this is just a brief overview. You could obviously spend hours talking about this, but I tried to cram as much information into the video as possible without making it too long, so you might want to watch it several times to absorb all of it. So the next video is going to be shooting scale armor with a crossbow and a few other things. So that'll be uploaded the day after this. And as soon as it's up, I'll put the link in the video description down below where you'll also find links to the sources I've used. And if you've enjoyed this, you know what to do. There's convenient buttons down there with which you can, you know, spread the thing and express your opinion of it and so on and so forth. Anyway, thanks for watching, folks. Have a good one and stay tuned for part two.